Go ahead. Okay. So, um, or like Dr. Glean said, uh, we'll be looking at the observables of photoluminescent and charge transfer today, starting with charge transfer. Um, what important physics concept relates to that in continuity equations? So, uh, for a little context of where we're at, uh, we did we talked about Redfield electron dynamic calculation last time. Um, we did some uh, calculations with those. Uh, one thing you can uh, analyze with that is charge transfer. And we need the continuity equation, uh, which is a um, description that pretty much tells us uh, charge charge is conserved. Um, so you've got local area, local area charges moving around a large area. Um, whatever charge there is has to be conserved. Um, one way it generally gets described as the um, partial derivative of the uh, charge density with respect to time uh, added to the divergence of the current density. Um, to adapt it to our model, um, we have a, uh, when you look at a couple of partial density distributions, um, so we have here on the bottom left, uh, partial density distribution of our balance band, and on the right, uh, our conduction band on the left, balance band on the right. Um, some items of note here, uh, you'll see this in integration with respect to X and Y. Um, to make our analysis simpler, we are just going to be looking across the C dimensions since it's easier to um, do some analysis looking at uh, just with respect to one dimension and the time variable. Um, I suppose if you want to see how it looked in different dimensions, you could just uh, turn your model around. Um, but for my model, that thing was one dimension C, so it worked out or the way I expected the charge to transfer was in the C direction. So that was good. Um, also, this row here is more like the density matrix or, uh, that we saw from previous uh, things last week. Um, so uh, from there, once we have this partial uh, density of our um, conduction band and our valence band, we have the difference of those to get our total uh, charge density. Um, we multiply that by the um, Coulomb char electron charge, I think, and then we get our um, get, we, then we have the uh, dist charge distribution that we'll put into our continuity equation. So uh, once we have that. Um, uh, we can continue to simplify our equation um, since the current density, which I believe um, we will be talking about next, um, it's a three dimensional um, vector quantity. It has an x, y, and z component. Um, since we've made the choice to focus on the z components, we can just say, all right, we'll just assume the average current density in the x and y direction uh, is zero. So when we do that, we can just focus on the z part. Uh, we integrate it, um, we get this expression for the um, current density, and from there, uh, we can implement it into mathematical code. So um, there's a um, file available on NERSC, um, that was created by uh, Dr. Johan, and um, uh, for it, you need the energy pop file, the RR file backed out, just like we did from last week. Basic calculations. Um, as I know, the current version of the file assumes you have 600 time steps. Uh, I had to do some manual manipulation to code itself since I didn't have 600 time steps for the graphics and some of the logic. Um, so just heads up about that if you use this file. Um, but once you do get that going, um, you have some pretty similar inputs to um, last week's sort of field dynamic observables for the initial goal, the initial electron, the homo limo, then the Z steps. Um, there's also some in code calculations. I'm still figuring out where everything says what it is in the code, but I think this is where the integration takes place. Um, so once you do that, uh, we do get similar graphs last week. We get a relaxation. Um, we can also see charge density as a function of time and space. Uh, here on the right, I have the model I was doing using for my research, which is a Judas particle of cadmium selenium and a lead selenium. Sorry. Um, so, but here on the left, um, our holes are like blue, electrons are yellow. Um, we can have graphs for our charge density, the time derivative of the charge density, and the change of the, change of the current, respectively. Um, so, this is the graph from earlier. And I think a note here is the time derivative tells us that yes, there's some change taking place. At some point in time, uh, there's also another simplified graph which just shows the current density changing as a function of time. 
Um, and here the slides just added in to say where the charge is zero, so you can see like where it's where it's changing around. So um, I guess that's my presentation on the continuity equation using it. Um, I'll leave it open to questions. Um, yeah. Let's thank Hadessa. <laughs> I have a question. Please. Go ahead. I know you said you specifically chose the Z direction. Do you know why uh, why that is? Uh, the way I set up my model, uh, this year it's oriented with respect to the Z direction. I was specifically exploring just saying spatial separation with respect to Z. So I was expecting the charge to, and also previous research I've done shows this uh, charge transfer between going in the Z direction. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you. And uh, how does if I'm not wrong, that uh, divergence operator is just applied in the Z direction. So, and code also is working just assuming that you want to have your plot just in the Z direction. It doesn't work for other direction. Otherwise, you should just uh, tweak the code if you want to, for instance, have a model stretch in the Y or X direction. Um, what, what was that again in here? Uh, I'm saying that your initial structure for these codes, usually you should have the codes are developed based on this assumption that you want to plot the distribution of the charges just in the Z direction. So if you have a different orientation in your chemical structure, you just need to tweak a little the code. By the way, thank you. I think you didn't get what I'm talking about. <laughs> I guess are you saying it looks like what I have in the code is different than what I have for my model? No, no. For, for instance, your model right now is in the Z direction. It's OK. But if it was a stretch in the Y direction, so that was not consistent with the, the current version of the codes. So that's the only thing that I'm talking about. OK. Why you choose one Why you don't choose an objection? Why? Um, it's just it was just how I chose to separate things. Um, I just decided to separate things in the Z direction, and then it also worked out that that's how these integration things work out. Why not Why not I, I don't know. I, there, I just have them spatially oriented with respect to C. So, and I was just interested in the charge transfer between the two. So, it was just how they were set up. Um, I suppose if I set it up in another way, I could just rotate the model as needed for this calculation. You got a couple of slides back. More, a little more. Before the color. Yeah. Can you go over why you could say that we can drop our x and y terms? Um, I think in part uh, we're focusing on the um, we are focusing on the distribution with respect to the z-axis. Mm -hmm. So. I guess while we're mainly interested in Z, otherwise I'm not completely sure why the assumptions made that you can just average the current density in the X and Y direction. For this, to, I guess, going from your first to the second, why did that require those derivatives to be constant? For this to be true, assuming that JX only depends on X, JY only depends on Y. Um, yeah. You have a notion of charge in you know, Y and X direction, or it is uh, only in, uh, in Z? Um, I guess since there's molecular dynamics going on, it's possible that there's X and Y, Z motion, X and y motion, but maybe it averages out, so it's negligible. Okay. So the, if we 
take it as an approximation so that there is a cube or a cylinder and things go on in the direction. So the uh, the uh, uh, so current days in X and Y do not change over over uh, so the, there is just the zero. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, a provocative question for the second part of today's talk, talks. Um, when the model is mostly emission, uh, when when it is right after it is being excited, at the process when when it transfers charge, or uh, like, can you comment? Will your model ever emit light or something you prevent it from emitting light? Uh, okay. I guess it depends on, well, I mean, it's the charge transfers both on the electrons going from one band to the other. As long as there's some charge transfer occurring, I'd expect there'd be some emission of light. So emission is facilitated or suppressed? When, when you're in the church, it's not. Uh, it's okay. It's a person. Because to, to recombine, they need to immediately merge together, right? If you don't want to pull apart uh, from each other. They at least are expected to, uh, to have uh, Low oscillator strengths and be not very easy. So they if, if they're physically separated oh. in space, okay. there is uh, their ability to combine and emit light should be otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So um, this is a connection between first and second chapter and uh, the um, assessing spectral signals. Of, of the standard structures is the indirect measure of charge transfer. Depending on how much charge is, is being transferred, it, uh, it is more or less of So, more, trans more charge transfer means less of it. will be darker. It will be darker. Okay. Uh, thank you. Dr. Klin, and thank you, Hadassa. So, I'm going to repeat that just a uh, exact uh, similar. Uh, uh, method and code uh, to quantify uh, current density. So uh, how does uh, meet the, uh, make the <laughs> life easier for me and cover all theory. So next please, uh, Dr. Killian. Uh, so previous week we uh, covered the ab initio exactly dynamics based on non-adiabatic coupling. So um, for uh, my model, if uh, Dr. Killing go to the next slide, I have a conjugated polymer, as you can see on the right, next to an uh, acceptor unit. So uh, here, uh, actually, this previous project, uh, the model was uh, actually the interface or the charge transfer was explored in the Z direction. So the, uh, the bottom uh, um, actually uh, chemical structure uh, is DPP polymer and the top one is uh, PCBM acceptor unit. So to quantify the charge transfer, uh, last week we uh, just measured the difference in the uh, middle figure, the, the difference between the positive and negative charge and uh, uh, actually define it as dipole and the derivative of that dipole gave us the current density. So, uh, but in this uh, presentation, we are going to use uh, another method as Hadassah uh, presented. So, uh, Dr. Kinnick, can we go next? Uh, and we can skip this. Uh, I had to delete this one. Yeah, as you can see in the right, uh, the difference between uh, positive and uh, negative charges gave us the dipole, and the derivative of that dipole gave us the uh, current density. So in that project, we use maximum value of this current density to uh, quantify uh, 
the current density and also characterize the best uh, photovoltaic system uh, with uh, uh, better actually uh, power conversion efficiency. Next, please. So in this uh, presentation, we want to use continuity equation. I don't want to go through that much. How does already uh, fully covered that? So here we, in this divergence uh, operator, actually we escape the x and uh, y direction since the charge transfer is uh, mm -hmm. uh, supposed to be uh, done in the z direction. We have uh, just that operator applied to the current density just in the z direction to uh, quantify the current density as an integral of that equation. So the parameter g is uh, something that we are looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, next, Dr. Kirin. So to run that code, uh, if you go to the MATLAB directory, you can find the charge density on the line seven. As uh, as I mentioned, just need to tweak the minimum and maximum orbitals mentioned in the energy gap. Also, you need to have the RRR file that uh, we review how to calculate that last week. Also, you need the band out file. Next, please. Yeah, if uh, we take a look uh, through the, uh, in the left, the yellow color represent the electron and blue represent the holes. And uh, based on the continuity e equation for DPP PCBM, we can uh, have the current density as the right figure. Here's the positive value uh, means the electrons move in the positive direction and the negative value means that electron move in the negative direction, actually. Uh, next, please. Uh, here you can, uh, again, in the right, you can see that uh, the amount of the charge transfer at the interface at the different times, uh, the whole, uh, which are transferred and the electrons. Next, please. And uh, here, if we just take a look through the absolute value of the current density. Uh, also in the next slide, we have the comparison of, uh, of uh, two method. Uh, Dr. Kinney, can we go next? Yeah, here the top uh, results uh, represent the, um, the current density uh, calculated by uh, derivative as a derivative actually of the dipole over the time. And the bottom one is the current uh, density uh, calculated by continuity equation. So for if I want to compare top and bottom, so in time, uh, logarithmic time of minus one, we have a peak, but the maximum value for these two methods is appeared uh, at different times. So usually we have the same location, same time for the peaks, but the maximum value at different uh, location. Uh, in addition to this, I'm not sure Dr. Kine, how to interpret that or how you can uh, find any other connection between do these two methods. Uh, can you please share also your feedbacks on this plot? Or does it make sense to have a absolute value of the current density when we are using continuity equation? So if one would uh, make an average uh, over the neighbors, like smoothing function, then uh, this uh, sharp maximum will disappear. So the mm -hmm. uh, main amount of charge is transferred at the same time. Yes, after smoothing data, if we ignore the uh, each moment, yes, that, that, that's it's a good quite, point. quite encouraging what you're showing. And uh, I would try to find proportionality coefficient and just show them not uh, in different panels, just on, on, on the same panel. Mm -hmm. Find the scale factor which will make them as close as possible. Sure. Okay. Yeah, definitely. I will do that. And yeah, that's the last slide. So thank you. If you have any question, I would be happy to answer. If any. Hi, please join me in thinking of you. Any questions uh, in the audience? Yeah, I I have one. 
Okay, yeah, please, please go ahead. So if uh, I understand, the, I guess the general idea is, the assumption is, uh, the charge transfer will happen in one direction. That's why you got this from bit and Z. Just uh, out of curiosity, how much more calculation time would it be to simply just have all three? And what what makes it so much more complicated to do all three dimensions? Uh, I didn't get exactly your question. Why we didn't uh, explore a three D system? This is your question. Yeah, yeah, yep. And I guess the main question is how much more time would it take to do all three? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. This is actually something that we are working on right now. So the, at first, we just develop a periodic model for mm -hmm. the polymer and put just one acceptor unit next to it and uh, also develop the interface in the Z direction. So this is a very idealized uh, periodic model mm -hmm. for this kind of bulk to junction. But for the project that we are doing right now, we develop the condensed 3D periodic uh, DFD model. So we pack multiple chains and acceptor units run with force width calculation to reach to the kind of density, experimental density values, a completely packed system. And then we are running uh, non-adiabatic couplings. But for sure, those systems are five to 10 times larger in case of number of atoms. So each system, uh, each uh, aspect of that cubic is around three nanometer. So they are pretty expensive and challenging models. And we are thinking how to actually quantify the charge transfer for such that 3D systems. For sure, this kind of uh, uh, approximation or idealization will not work for that 3D model. So we need uh, to find another way to uh visualize or to quantify actually characterize the charge transfer between the donor and the acceptor unit in the 3d system yeah okay yeah that, that clarified it uh, thank you yeah. can i add to the discussion for sure please so um, on one hand uh, three comments first actual quantum dynamics uh, can be processed independent on the direction of charge transfer. The question is uh, that we raised and uh, we supported is about interpreting the pathway of charge transfer when it deviates from a uh, single direction. And next talk, you partially address this question. But from industrial point of view, uh, most devices do have like one anode and one cathode, or uh, the solar cell or, or diode have two terminals, and the charge transfer in a selected direction is typically much more important. So, uh, therefore, analysis on, of charge transfer in one direction is uh, valid and important, even if the system shows uh, more rich behavior. Mm -hmm. So it's all an opinion. Uh, more questions in the audience? More questions online? Uh, Aaron, would you like to go to would you like to read question by Aaron and address? Uh, sure. I will ask uh, to quantify charge transfer. Could you project Kunsham orbitals onto the time? Evolving density. Uh, I do not have a certain answer for Aaron, so it should be doable when it comes to your mind for sure. Uh, can you provide more comments and tips, Aaron, if uh, you think it's useful for this project? It looks like Aaron's question is, uh, in a good sense, provocative. He uh, pushes us towards toward the next door. <laughs> uh, uh, in some sense, what Amir is showing is already projecting quantum orbitals onto uh, time evolving density, just in one dimension. And the question is, can one go into like two or three dimensions? 
Aaron, is your question interpreted correctly? Yeah, but I think wouldn't there be like a numerical way to do it where you could like multiply like occupied and unoccupied? I don't know. I'd have to think about it more how to phrase it. Okay. But essentially, like instead of projecting orbitals, projecting charge density in like whatever grid you're using. Okay, so instead of population of orbitals, uh, write an equation of motion for uh, charge density distribution. Right. Uh, it is it is very possible, but it, it will be much more expensive because amount of grid points for three dimensional distribution is substantially bigger than amount of uh, uh, discrete orbitals that we are pursuing. Right. So we are propagating like hundred orbitals. And there, even a humble system has about a million grid points, or at, at, at least 100,000. So it will be different level of numerical complication with about the same uh, output. Mm -hmm. But in derived equations, uh, it, it is very appropriate. And uh, mm, some people write density matrix equation of motion uh, not as uh, matrix in discrete basis, but as a continuous density with two independent indices. So as a, as a, as a method for theory for, for equation derivation, it's quite popular. Um, his presentation will answer a lot of questions that were posed to previous two speakers. So uh, uh, he'll probably will give credit to Aaron. And go to London. Aaron and Landa. Yes. But uh, this uh, teamwork um, goes out of box. It goes out of uh, uh, restriction of one dimension and shows uh, some videos about charge transfer in uh, like multi dimensional charge transfer. Okay, let's go ahead. So we are looking at generating 2D dynamics in space. So to begin with, we need our input files. So all these, so all these files on what right here are the input files we need for the MATLAB code. And then we have a few different files we need to generate them. So we need part charge files and the trim.sh code. And that code generates the part charge.trim files and the lockpot.trim file. And then we need our concar and the atom.sh code, and that's going to generate these xx1.xyz files. In addition to that, we also need the RRR, the band out, the energy pop, which are the standard that we've been discussing for the last few weeks. And then these two MATLAB codes, and then the band out 2D, which is generated by this first MATLAB code. So if we look at how we actually generate these, so here we're generating the dot trim files. So if we look at the dot trim script, so you would want to copy the par charge files into a separate directory because the script deletes them at the end. Um, so what the script does is it takes our the par charge files and converts them into a into a form that uh, MATLAB can read. So the things to look for here in the, the red box here, you want your Oracle indexes. And in the blue box here is the number of lines to delete from the part charge file, which should be your atom count plus nine. So if, when you run the script, they'll give you this string here, telling you that it's working. So then if you open one of the dot trim files, this is what it should look like. So you start out with this line with three numbers. Those are those are grid points that we're going to use. And then everything after that is the orbital data for that band. So if you were to open just the plain par charge, you would see a copy of the postcard above this. That's what we deleted with the script on the previous slide. And then to create the XYZ files that we need, 
you need to first create a postcard.xyz, which I have detailed how you can do on Nurse. So if you type in module so fast, it'll give you a list of useful paths. And you're interested in this one that has the V, V, T, S, T scripts in it. And then you can, using that in, in that directory, there's a postcard to XYZ script that we can use to create the postcard.xyz file. And then you can run the atom.sh script and it will request that you enter in the atoms in your model. So enter those in and then it will make XYZ files for each atom. So then if we look at our first of the MATLAB script, which is the trim part, trim parts to x.m, and there's a few different versions where there's different letters instead of x, there's a y, there's an a. Um, so th this file needs all the dot trim files that were generated um, by the trim.sh script. So you're going to need all the part charge.trims and the lockpot.trim. And all the lockpot.trim is is a copy of one of the part charge to get the initial dimensions. Uh, so some things you need to some things you need to work on or modify. You have your homo, omen, and omax like like normal. Um, depending on how what band you're looking on, you may have to change the number of zeros here in the part charge. And you will have to modify um, the several of these lines. This first, the Z equals, the Y equals, the band out equals, the orbital equals, and the index three, um, depending on which dimension you're trying to um, integrate out, integrate over. And you would have to make the same modifications to this for loop, which is a little farther down. So in this case, in this case, we're we're integrating over the x dimension, and it, this script will pump out a figure that looks something like this. Now for the second script, which is the uh, another one of these four MEQ scripts. Um, you see that we have our standard parameters: the IH, the IE. Homo, Omen, Omax. Um, so you need to enter all those. Then a little further down, you'll find this band out 2, 2D equals load line. And you'll see all these dim 1, dim 2, dim 3. You need to enter those values. And they are those. They are these three numbers right here. And another another way you can look at them, this is from the workspace on MATLAB from the trim.m script. So it, it reads it in there as well. Um, another place you need to change is this line, which is toward the end of a really long for loop. This is what gives you the axis you're interested in. So you can see that I've matched it up to dimension one and dimension three because I'm looking at the XZ plane. Um, so then we need to load in our atom coordinate files. So this is the, all the dot XYZs that we generated. So you see in here, we have them where they load and we're loading and you notice that they all are a atom, atom symbol one dot XYZ, so chlorine, carbon, cesium, hydrogen, nitrogen, lead. Um, another thing to note with where these red boxes are, depending on what um, plane you're looking at, you will have to change those numbers. Um, David, where did you generate the, those XYZ files? Right here. So we use this. This atom script makes them. 
Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Good. So you, you just this this requires the post our postcard X Y Z as an input, and then you adjust when it requests it. You enter in what atoms are in your system. Yeah, and, gotcha. and it'll go through and make all the X Y Z files we need for that step. Okay, thank you. Um, so then further down the line, we need to specify bonds and you need to do this for every bond type that you're interested in. So I've, I've opened up the for loop for the carbon hydrogen bond so you can see it, but there's also nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, carbon, C, uh, chlorine, lead, any bond type that you're interested in, you would have to do this for, um, so the major thing here is once again, depending on what what dimensions you're looking at, you would have to change the order of the Z, Y, and X in this box. Um, so here we need to specify the number of states for the conduction band and valence band. Um, so see we have the, these numbers right here to specify that and then you click run and hope that it works the code takes a long time to run um, so if you if it works somewhat I need it needs to be cleaned up you get a picture of what we're seeing off to the left but not to the right here um, and you can see that we have a contour draft overlaid with my sys uh, atomic system where the contour draft is indicating the orbitals. And I'm trying to, this little figure off to the left is trying to indicate what I'm showing. So this is a volume slice of the par charge from VMD. So you see that we have this slice running through the model. And assuming I did it correctly, that should be the slice we're looking at. But I'm not 100% sure I positioned it correctly in VMD. Um, so this is just a snapshot. It actually creates a video. And this was one of my more early attempts. So it has a bit of oddities going on. As you can see, that it appears that the contour graph is actually moving and covering up atoms and uncovering atoms as it goes along. So if we, we go to the next slide, which is also a video but does not seem to want to play. We can see a little nicer looking one where we have the orbitals moving and the atoms, we can see them the entire time. And you can see that the orbitals seem to be playing around the lead positions. At least what I believe in the lead positions. <laughs> so how do you interpret charge transfer in this video? So the video, as the video plays, it's time moving. So you can see that we have the the charge. You can see that the charge is changing here as time goes on. It's going from yellow now to background to blue. And you can see. You can see that happening throughout. So the idea is with this model, we're, we're, we're hoping for charge transfer along basically this column of atoms right here. And with a small amount over on this one. That is the last slide. Okay, please join me. Thank you, David. So this uh, impressive talk can make everyone speechless, but maybe uh, there are uh, questions. Sure.
I have another question. So, may I? Yeah, yes, please, please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, for different initial excitation, we need to repeat that code. So how, in addition to visualization, how we can quantify the charge transfer or other excited state uh, parameters? How we can report that for a paper or something like that? For instance, if you repeat, three times we cannot put a movie inside a paper so how we can report these kinds of results um so this would be an additional addition to our standard graphs in addition you actually can put videos in supporting information or supplemental information um, yes but this could be your main results for such that this study right could be pretty expensive okay. uh, trying to to use this specifically you would have to use a series of frames so like this frame and then this frame this and this and this and this and then this if, if you wanted to do this specifically in a paper you would probably have to do a series of frames instead of a video And what's your main, main result from it? Why do you just specify the atomic bonds? Um, because that's how they're drawn. So the this one. So if you look this line right here, that's actually specifying the distance, a cutoff distance, and it, this part right here is specifying to if it's within that cutoff distance to plot plot the bond, so it plots a vector. Okay, so you are just artificially connecting them together. Yeah, which is artificially connected. In some sort of this uh, script replaces uh, in G or G move just a little, a little lower level. Because when, when you merge this uh, dynamics of church with atomistic models, they, when, when it's lines depending on the distance. You are changing the so the plane should be constant about where this orange plane is in the model to the left. My understanding of how it works. So what is the condition of changing the charge density from right to zero? Um, so it would be... This is due to spatial position of your 3D plane or the... So, so we have our 3D, 3D model, our 3D model, and we have a slice somewhere through the center okay. somewhere. So blue would be on one side of the slice, Yellow would be on the other side of the slice. So yellow would, when you make the yellow, it's worse, close to the atom clusters. It'd be closer to the to the screen, to the viewer, to the so it's coming in and out of the screen type of idea, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm interpreting the question of the a little bit different. So you go to the slide where you need uh went down to the Okay, so I'm, I'm requesting the way goes. Wait. So um, here, one takes the three-dimensional uh, charge density as it has been read into script. Select at which value of a certain coordinate we want to make a slice because the plane is just fixing one coordinate and letting others change, and then point it to the to the other. But if one wants to redo two-dimensional dynamics at other slice of uh, of this plane, one needs to change this parameter and redo it. So it's uh, uh, only one slice out of three-dimensional dynamics, and uh, one can find different results for different ways of chopping chopping the, the model. If, what are you asking this? Yes, so which one do we need to choose? Uh, based? 
well, it's not a question to a program, but it's a question of to the one which generates results. Depending on what you need, you select position of your plane. So, okay. Um, uh, so the lock pot, that's because of how Landon wrote the script. Um, it was designed for lock pots, not for bar charges originally. Um, and we just carried it over. So it, it the, the way it works works is this, this. So if you look at the, the script that we generate, the bar charge files, the last line of it is literally just copying the last one to lockpot.trim. So it they have the same same, same format. So we all all that's doing is reading in this first line, this 378, 120, 240 line. All that lock that lockpot line in the code is doing is reading that in and cap determining what dim dim event is. So just to get some pattern. Yeah, it's a history, it's like uh, inherited from, from uh, historically. So I don't remember like three, four, five years ago, London was uh, an undergraduate, which is not a wonder. And he was taking uh, physical chemistry course, that you guys I know today. Um, and there, there was a project to look for wave function and wave packet propagation in the multi dimensional potential. And uh, London decided to extract potential uh, from a uh, data and potential in what we see in the final output if he needed to just read and put then uh, several generations of uh, researchers found this core code useful like there are maybe like, maybe a few more for you uh, there was a question from Aaron in the chat line Aaron asks what if part charts file has not numeric values such as a bunch of stars um the the best way to do do this is to hope that it doesn't. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't that lucky. <laughs> um, so at this point, what I've done is copy the previous bar charge to make it work. Um, I need to sit down and regenerate them and figure out how to actually make them where they give me numeric values. And I don't know how to do that because I'm not entirely sure what costs them to not have numeric values. Are you satisfied or you want to give other uh, way to avoid this problem? Well, I'm not sure how to avoid it, but if it does happen, like, I don't, generally what I do is I just, there's a, well, it's two steps. So first, you can, there's a Unix command to tell it to search a file for any commands. So if you just tell it to search for stars, and then you can put in another command to tell you which line that those stars are at. Then you can use, there's like another Unix command where you can jump to that line and just set it to zero. Okay, so if one point out of a million uh, has a spike or error uh, and we, we place it to zero, it will be not a big error in the integrated uh, result. Right. And you'll know if it's there because um, I don't like know MATLAB, how... yeah, MATLAB won't load the file. It'll give an error. Yeah, it gives, it gives a very annoying error. And uh, there are two places like SED or yeah, it's, it's a, like there's that. a few different versions that you can do to replace this. The grep minus capital FN allows you to search for it and, and gives you the line number. So the F, F allows you to search for the, the string and the N gives you line number. That's what those, the FN option does. Um, I do have a question, okay, or comment, can you go to the very last slide? So uh, I think Amir was asking about the uh, interpretation of uh, um, this results, right? Yeah. If I think it was it as well. Yes. So um, I, I will try to interpret, but uh, David, please correct me. So this model consists of uh, 
three units. So here are the fragments of thin film, which is as, as thin as uh, two atomic layers, and it interfaces with um, uh, thin film, which is as thick as uh, five atomic layers. And this thin film is two layers, and five layers do have different regime of uh, quantum confinement. The gap in thinner is bigger than in thicker. So it is expected that both electron and hole will migrate from a confined, more, from more confined to less confined. And if we try to um, we run the dynamics, we will see that uh, charge density it appears in this lower segment and will reappear uh, in the upper segment, at least comedatively. I mean, does it make sense as a, just as an attempt to interpret? Yes, of course. Thank you. Uh, more questions, David? Uh, I have one more question. <laughs> yeah, can you go to a slide number 11, I think? So uh, here, that uh, red rectangular, it's for yeah. setting of XZ, right? That's... Z Y. Z -Y. What if we want to change to another plane? For instance, if you want to uh, change to X Y plane, how do you change it? Um. So the Z should be the last one, and whether X or Y should should be first depends on how you organize these ones uh, okay. depend on um, how you organize these ones. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay, guys. Thank you. And there was a question in the room by Joseph. Can I answer my question? My question was just going to be how we change the numbers for loading the atomic variables. But you kind of answered it. Has to, has to so the idea, the idea is, is you got two dimensions. So you want, and we're looking at it in two dimensions. So the x and the y, assuming you, so assuming z is coming out, out of you on this movie at the end. So let's assume this is y, this is x, and then z is coming out. That this first row, that's going to be the x. The second row is going to be the y. And this third row is going to be the C. So you would need to adjust them based on what your specific system is. So if you want the Z to be the X axis in the final movie, it should be the first one. If you want X to be for X axis, it should be the first one. And X is the one, two is Y, three is Z within your molecular system. So if you, if, like, if you look at your model and it has a coordinate, those are how they relate. 